Welcome. I'm so happy to be here with you today uh, discussing this such an important topic. So we are, we're discussing today challenges, opportunities and practical insights related to the AI Act. And I want to start with Luca. From your perspective, during the latest months of the negotiation, what were the most challenging issues more from the negotiation aspect? Thank you, Luisa. Yes, indeed. I mean, I, I've been in Brussels following the, the process the entire time. And yeah, some some people would joke that I was hiding in the meeting room sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I would say, you know, um, first of all, just to give you a sense uh, of where this is coming from. Uh, when the AI Act was first proposed, the overall mood was like, this was a premature proposal that the technology was not mature yet. And so the, the, the commission was, was jumping the gun, basically. Then after um, the public release of ChatGPT, AI became such a hype that uh, the mood became, uh, you know, you're, you're too slow, this is going too fast. Uh, and so on and so forth. So it's not only uh, the fact that people like to complain, but uh, also it shows the, the limits of trying to regulate a technology that moves uh, at such a pace that you have a new generation every few months. So indeed, I would say uh, the, the most challenging moment was the realization that uh, you know, um, ChatGPT and the underlying foundation model uh, basically didn't fit in, in the AI Act. I mean, if you talk to the commission, they would tell you, yeah, but we have some transparency for chatbot. Uh, I, I doubt that would have been considered, uh, you know, sufficient by anyone involved. Um, so, you know, for how much the commission said the proposal was future proof, well, it, it didn't even last the time of the negotiations. Uh, and I think that the European Parliament, you know, it, it took them more time to find their position, but I think they actually developed a much more comprehensive approach to foundation models. Um, and managed to to get their uh, their basic idea through. Um, I think that the most challenging moment was probably when the negotiations were, went very close to breaking down. Uh, when you had this technical meeting and basically the Spanish presidency uh, said that they had no mandate to negotiate on foundation models because France, Germany and Italy uh, didn't want any hard rules for foundation models because of the startups uh, you were mentioning before, in particular, Mistral AI, to a lesser extent, Aleph Alpha. So I think that uh, there we, we really saw uh, different interests collide. You have the interest of the commission, the parliament that had, a, you know, a political pressure to reach an agreement, also the presidency, of course, uh, before the elections, because they they didn't want to miss this window of opportunity to, uh, to come forward with this uh, um, first uh, regulation in the world on artificial intelligence. And of course, politicians, they especially before elections, they need victories to bring to their constituencies, to get reelected, to get reappointed and so on. And on the other hand, you had um, some private actors that, you know, uh, pushed uh, their, their domestic governments uh, toward their interest. And uh, their interest was, of course, not to have uh, rules in these uh, specific sectors and that, you know, uh, compared to other sectors, the European companies still had a chance uh, to, to compete with big tech. Um, so I would say this was possibly the, the most delicate moment. You also had a very delicate one during the last trilogue itself on law enforcement, uh, when everyone was really exhausted, they had been negotiating for 
I think close to 24 hours straight. And, you know, I think that uh, everyone was really nervous. Attention was through the roof. And at the end, they called for a recess. Uh, and I think that was uh, that was uh, <laughs> probably the good call to make since, all, you know, policymakers are, are humans, not AI. So they also need rest. So You made a great uh, impression, right, on all of us. It, we saw the pictures like they were hours and hours so for everyone that said that european bureaucrats don't work so that picture showed that at least with with this topic they are working hard yeah i mean you know again this comes back to the political pressure and time pressure and i think you know probably then we'll come to the final text later on but i think that probably that played an important role in how the the AI Act landed because there was a political need to find an agreement by December if they didn't want to miss this opportunity. And, you know, with a new mandate, you never know what happens. So, I And, and as, as you were hiding in the meeting rooms, I'm kidding. So as you were paying attention to the discussions and, and the details of these discussions, do you think that the, the members of the European Parliament, they have technical knowledge? What did you feel? The discussions there were all the time there were technical people involved? Well, you know, this is a technology where you have very few experts. Well, a lot of improvised experts, but not so many actual experts. And uh, especially elected officials like MEPs, they don't, they are not elected for their technical knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. They are elected because they represent their constituents. So I think it, it took some time for all institutions to build up expertise in this area just because it was completely new for everyone to regulate um, i know a few experts that were in the background indeed advising uh, and you know like actively also during the negotiations uh, i know of uh, of uh, professors or also and um, NGOs that were advising on, on the more technical level. I would say in their European Parliament, they probably started uh, their work early with the AIDA committee, this ad hoc committee uh, that was set up uh, in 2019, I think, something like that. Um, for the commission, it was the white paper. So, you know, the, there was some preparatory work. So the AI Act didn't, didn't uh, drop from the sky from one day to another. Good. Interesting. So as we were talking about professors and law, so I want to uh, ask a question to Professor Jean Claudio. Uh, I want to hear from you a little bit about your research, if you want to explain to the audience, for those that are not familiar. So why explainability and transparency in the context of AI, and especially in the context of general purpose AI systems, so chat GPT, why people need to know, it? or is it possible, or aren't we pushing it too much, and actually it's, it's not possible? So why do these obligations matter? Great. Uh, thank you so much, Luisa, for this uh, opportunity for this question also. Um, so, of course, it's not easy to answer, <laughs> but I can give, uh, of course, my two cents on the topic. And uh, I agree with you that, uh, and with uh, Luca, that, uh, you know, the, the, the efforts towards a human-centric approach to the AI Act was uh, meaningful, in particular in the second half of the negotiations. And, um, yeah, you mentioned some important elements there. Uh, you mentioned uh, the explainability requirements that now we have for high-risk uh, AI systems. Um, I, I, I would like just to connect this with what was before the AI Act. In Europe, we have the GDPR, and there was a lot of emphasis on Article 22 of the GDPR, which is the right not to be subject to automated decisions, and the connected rights of individuals to have a human in the loop in case decisions are automated and have significant or, or similarly significant effect on individuals um, then they have or uh, the, the right to contestation right to uh, express one's view connected to this there was a right to know the logic of algorithms but this duty was just for data controllers data controllers are usually just what in the AI act are the deployers 
So the users, uh, like my university using AI on uh, students, uh, God no, <laughs> but, uh, or whatever, uh, the pol law enforcement authority, well, law enforcement are not under the GDPR, but uh, under the law enforcement directive. Um, you know, uh, uh, companies that use AI, so they can somehow uh, give some logic about the reasoning, uh, sorry, um, about the, 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 the decision-making system. But now the AI Act is covering the gap between the producer of AI, who are the ones that know, and should know, at least, or should control, or should have a, um, a yes or no decision on whether we want to go on some uh, 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 unexplored, uh, impossible black box or white box systems. So the gap from them, from from there to the um, uh, users of AI systems, uh, I think we needed this step. We needed to impose the duties of explainability on the AI provider, the AI producers, the AI designers, however we want to call them, to make meaningful, to make use of Article Twenty Two of the GDPR of a possible right to explanation with all the limits of explanation. So this is important in terms of stakeholders and in terms of scope. Uh, and and I think this was uh, uh, th this was this was something very very uh, important. Then you asked about generative AI. Uh, well, for generative AI, this was also um, very interesting in terms of policy making. Um, from the very initial proposal of the commission, we know that general purpose AI, generative AI was not in the proposal, but then uh, the political pressure, the media, the release of ChatGPT uh, in November uh, 22, uh, uh, um, uh, raised the issue of this urgency. We needed to do something, right? And it's super interesting because if the EU policy making would be quicker, we wouldn't have the opportunity to add general purpose AI regulation in the, in the law, because actually this was added after one year and a half from the first proposal of the European Commission. In other ways, we could say that this law is, uh, in general, a AI laws are intrinsically um, um, uh, non-technologically neutral, because they need to look at what's happening in the last years. But I think the AI Act is wise in that respect, because it's Identifying the issue of general purpose AI, it was not too late to do that. And then putting some predictability requirements. And this is something important. All the, the, all the critics or to the AI Act say, well, <clears throat> let's say critics from right wing are saying, well, we shouldn't regulate because it's impossible, because we don't know, because we cannot predict, etc. Right? But the point is that the AI Act is giving predictability to what is permitted and to what is not permitted. General, generative AI had already been prohibited in Europe, but at national levels. We saw the example of Italy with the Garante Data Protection Authority that a couple of years ago uh, decided to block ChatGPT also for the transparency elements. They had several conditions and lists of why ChatGPT should have been uh, uh, blocked in Italy. One was about children, another was about transparency uh, um, and also understandability and also the uh, enforcement of some uh, data protection rights, like right to uh, accuracy, erasure, etc. So uh, in that respect, I think now the AI Act is saying general purpose AI, of course, well, there's no prejudice to the GDPR. So if there are data protection problems, okay, data protection authorities can regulate, can decide, can block, can um, uh, give sanction. Still, we now know that uh, if uh, general purpose AI respect the systemic risk uh, uh, assessment duties, and uh, the transparency duties that are in the special parts of general purpose AI um, uh, chapter in the AI Act, uh, they can they can release, they can use, they can commercialize the system. So yeah, and 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 why is it important to know and to understand? I think I think um, one thing we should look at, and then I will conclude, is not just <clears throat> technical transparency. Technical transparency is super important. The other step is critical transparency. Now I'm citing Mireille Hildebrandt. She wrote uh, uh, 12 years ago about critical transparency as uh, the right to know the risks, the right to know the implications. So what I, what I think this human-centered regulation from the GDPR to the AI Act are trying to do is we don't need just... we, we 
we don't need to know just uh, how the black box works, but the impacts that this black box have on fundamental rights, on society, on human rights. So maybe the black box cannot be opened, but the effects of this black box, how this black box affects other things, impacts other things, this can be seen and can be uh, prevented. So there are some systems that, that cannot be explained, but all business models can be mitigated and uh, explained. Thank you so much. And I want to follow up also now with the, with the, another question. So Article 29A of the AI Act establishes fundamental rights impact assessments for high-risk AI systems. So uh, deployers have to perform this uh, FRIA, right, the, 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 the acronym, fundamental rights impact assessment before they deploy a high-risk AI. So I want to ask you, how do you see this impact assessment? So do you think it will be effective? And it has a big name, right, fundamental rights so the way it's, it was legislated, so the way the text is written, do you think it will be, it's, it's what you were expecting? So you were one of the scholars that, that were fighting for it and you were asking for more protection. The final text, do you think it helps protect people or, or just kind of it was uh, diluted and not so, so helpful? Uh, thank you so much for this question. I think it's, uh, yeah, of course, it's one of the topic closed, closest to my heart. <laughs> so I think um, uh, just to rapidly respond to this, I will try to be super brief. Uh, it was introduced by the European Parliament amendments uh, uh, and then it was negotiated. There were some... Um, uh, turbulences in the last uh, months. Uh, Luca knows more about that uh, because we were reading from his articles. Uh, and the council, the Spanish council, was uh, proposing a mediation because the council, uh, sorry, the Spanish presidency of the council uh, was proposing some mediations, in particular because the um, the um, um, the idea that the council and the commission had was that this fria was uh, uh, redundant. Because you already have some impact assessment, uh, uh, for example, you have the data protection impact assessment, or you have, for social media, for example, you have already fundamental right impact assessment in the DSA, in the Digital Services Act, Article 34. Um, so this was this idea that was redundant, so they want to, wanted to limit it to public authorities uh, and not to private authorities. And also they want to, to make it mostly voluntary. So there was this final, uh, let's say, fight. <laughs> uh, NGOs uh, helped a lot to advocate for this. And also scholars, as you said, we, we, we launched with the Brussels Privacy Hub, we launched a, a letter from 150 professors uh, signing for a meaningful fundamental right impact assessment. Uh, but what, what, what is the final text, the final compromise? So we are happy that it's not just for public authorities. It's also for private authorities, but just if they uh, uh, serve public functions. And then in the recital, it's uh, explained that public functions can be hospitals, can be education. So this is good. Um, uh, and it applies to banks and insurances also uh, explicitly. So this is also very good. Uh, the idea is that if you limit FRIA just to public authorities, you are losing most, most of the problems, right? Because you're missing the point because we know that our fundamental rights are at risk for also in relationship and mostly to private companies when we are consumers, when we are uh, customers, etc. So that is very good. What is not so good is that something was moved to the recital. The first thing is participatory approach. We really need the TISFRIA have the participation of impactor stakeholders. This is still there, but just as a recommendation in the recital, not in the body of the article. So this is a bit disappointing. The other thing is that while in the DSA the, uh, for, for social media, the FRIA, the Fundamental Right Impact Assessment, should be every year, so it should be regular on a regular basis. Here in the AI Act, they say that this regularity, the cyclic uh, uh, nature of FRIA, is just when risks change, when the level of risk change. So it's kind of uh, arbitrary uh, 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 cycling uh, uh, a timeline. But uh, yeah, I think I will stop now. <laughs> so I want to ask a question to Risto now. So is, Risto is a researcher and you, you recently published Risto, uh, the EU Commission Manifesto, where you talk about recommendations for the next EU mandate. I think it's very uh, timely and important. So I, I would like you to share a bit with the audience. I, I'm not sure if everyone is aware. So please share a little bit about it. And from your point of view, uh, what are the most important recommendations and why they matter? Yeah, th thanks a lot for having me. Actually, it's um, interestingly, it's my birthday today, and what a what a great way to have uh, you know celebrate my birthday with you having uh, talking about one of the first uh, 
ever major comprehensive AI regulations in the world, right? So, so th thanks a lot for having Happy me. Uh, Happy yeah, thank you. I, I actually, before I respond to your question, I want to go very briefly back to what um, both Luca and uh, Gian Claudio mentioned around general purpose AI and the kind of political process around it. It, it, it I, I want to push back a little bit or like kind of add some nuances to this uh, this discussion. So the European Commission initially released uh, the AI Act draft back in April 2021. and. Uh, external stakeholders were asked for input in August 2021. So a lot of like over 300 different uh, stakeholders um, submitted feedback to the European Commission. Actually, already in November 2021, when Slovenia was leading the council uh, presidency, they already introduced an article titled General Purpose AI Systems. So that was already before the end of 2021. And, and then in May 2022, France made very significant, France, which was then leading the European, uh, the Council of the EU, they made very significant changes to that, uh, to that uh, specific article. They ac actually asked very meaningful uh, requirements from the developer of general purpose AI systems. And now think about when ChatGPT was released, November 2022. So actually, O over a year of discussion around general purpose AI systems already happened. Uh, not all of that was around, you know, very large scale language models or anything like that. It was all kinds of other types of systems that were included in the general purpose AI system category. But actually, you should give people should give a little bit more credit to the EU institutions and the policymakers because, like, arguably, they actually did foresee some of those things based on also the input of I don't know academics and civil society and other stakeholders, of course, but. But yeah, it's not it's not exactly true that ChatGPT came and you know completely destroyed the uh, the regulation. Even though it did, of course, have a major impact, uh, no doubt about that. But anyway, uh, just wanted to like add that nuance to the discussion. Uh, coming back to the topic um, or the question you asked, yes, um, we recently submitted uh, or, or published uh, an EU Commission manifesto, and we we had something like you know, seven or so recommendations there, but maybe the key ones that I would highlight is one is really ensure that the EU AI office, which is a new regulatory body that the AI Act uh, uh, set up is robust and has the ability to perform various tasks that it has been set to do. Uh, this is no small feat because the number of tasks that they have is actually quite significant. Uh, they, they have to uh, monitor the regulation, how well the regulation is working. They have to try to enforce it. They have to coordinate between member states. Uh, they, they have uh, the whole general purpose AI systemic risk designation issue and topic. They have a lot of different tasks. And the uh, AI office plans to hire up to 80 people over the next uh, year or so, uh, together with 20 people from the European Commission, uh, up to 100 staff. Uh, so. Compared to, for example, the UK AI Safety Institute, which has been uh, um, working for the last year or so already, uh, they are at a very early stage. And I would recommend them to you know, make sure that they are in touch with the UK AI Safety Institute, learn everything that they are doing, make sure that they have enough money to hire the best people to carry out these tasks. It's uh, going to be a huge uh, challenge. The second thing we recommended was actually you know continuing um, developing this regulatory package around uh, digital technologies so uh, the, the current uh, european commission or soon to be the previous one started the ai liability directive which uh, should be continued they should finish this and arguably it was put on pause exactly for the reason that the AI act would finish and then the liability directive would people could make sure that it's um, quite aligned with the AI Act. Uh, so why is it necessary? Well, the EU AI Act mostly talks about ex ante requirements. So requirements uh, for companies before they put something to the market. And, and hopefully that, that will reduce risks, right? But it's not guaranteed that even if they follow the AI Act to the letter, that they will avoid all kinds of damages and incidents. It's not guaranteed. And if a damage or, a, or some kind of harm occurs, who is liable? Who, is, who should uh, bear the cost? Who should you know, support uh, those who have been harmed? I, I think it's very crucial to, to finish that um, legislative document as well. And then finally, 
there's a, a mechanism called the codes of uh, practices for general purpose AI. And, and these are essentially you know, guidelines or documents that companies can follow to show compliance with the act, especially when it comes to general purpose AI tools uh, or, or um, systems before technical standards are developed for, so, for those kinds of uh, models and systems. And we think it's extremely important that those are drafted with the inclusion of civil society. Companies, industry oftentimes has a lot of power over technical standards, these guidelines, and for good reasons, but civil society has very strong advantages um, that they can add. For example, they are they don't have commercial interest. They're interested in the public good, uh, how, how well uh, AI systems work for the, uh, for the whole society. And they could bring that perspective uh, and make sure that the industry doesn't, you know, only serve uh, their own interest. Uh, and, and sometimes they can also bring a lot of expertise that maybe industry doesn't have. So yeah, those, those would be the main things that I would highlight from all the seven recommendations that we have. Uh, people can look up our document and you know, uh, look for other types of recommendations there. So now let's move to a more uh, uh, dynamic part of the, the, the session today. So I want to hear uh, from each of you a, a little bit from the same topic. So from each of your perspective, when do you see the final text of the EU AI Act? What are the most problematic issues and why? So let's start with Luca. Well, that's easy. I'll give you only one um, typos. Um, <laughs> I, I was actually uh, at an event with uh, some lawyers a few weeks ago, and, and one of them told me it's, it's incredible that they would publish a law with typos. It's I mean, from a lawyer perspective, this makes their job so much easier because, yeah. you know, if you take the part on um, or open source software, it says the opposite of what is the, the legislator meant to say. And, you know, if you have a text that is not polished, unclear, it's very easy for companies and lawyers to go around it, to, to get it dismissed in court. So, you know, I think that uh, the, the highest price that the political momentum had to pay for the AI Act was the quality of the text. So the lawyer linguists are meant to uh, polish the text. Uh, let's see if they do some miracles. Huh? But... I think there are parts of the text that cannot be fixed. If you take Article 6, it's a mess. I, I would challenge anyone to say they have a solid legal case to use the filtering conditions for of Article 6. I think, you know, the, the text is so uncertain, only if you are a rich company, you take the risk to get fined afterwards. So, you know, I think on on certain parts, the text is truly self-defeating and that the overall quality, even by the admission of uh, people that have been involved, it's, uh, it's uh, quite low. Thank you, Luca. Uh, so, Jean Claudio? Yeah, so, um, yeah, first of all, I would like to say something I was a bit disappointed with is the emotional recognition part. Um, from, a, from a legal, ethical perspective, emotional recognition is one of the most uh, problematic and intrusive things. Um, uh, maybe just, just uh, as, a, as an initial disclaimer to this answer, before I, I dive into the emotional recognition thing, uh, I see this was a huge effort. Uh, it started as a, 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 a as a safety uh, like product safety instrument, and now it's a fundamental rights general regulation. Uh, so it, it, it was huge, and it's normal that we have typos, we have problems because, of course, it was huge with so many stakeholders. Such an intense, uh, I think, it was the longest or one of the longest trialogues uh, ever, uh, one of the longest uh, list of amendments ever, <laughs> more than the GDPR. Uh, much more, and the GDPR was the unprecedented case. And, uh, and also about the, the, the general purpose AI development, as Risto was saying, just to, 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 to clarify on that, yes, the Slovenian presidency had already advanced this, but now it's a new treaty on generative AI because we have six articles, you know, just to say how it, it grew. Okay, but uh, something could have been done better in terms of emotional recognition, as I was saying. 
In the initial proposal of the commission, emotional recognition was considered limited risk. And of course, it's 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 crazy, right? It shouldn't be limited. It's 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 very problematic. Uh, the parliament had proposed to ban emotional recognition, but there was this discussion that it's a pseudoscience, you are going to limit science, all these discussions, and also the therape therapeutic use, the anti-suicidal use, etc. Now it has been put as high risk, but a couple of cases, so education and employment, are prohibited. So you cannot detect emotion of uh, in the employment context and in the educational context. So it's it's why not in other problematic fields? Why not on migration? Why for migration purposes should we shouldn't we ban emotional recognition? You know, I, as you said, I've worked a lot on vulnerability, and one of the biggest sources of vulnerabilities being a migrant, uh, 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 you know, facing the challenges of borders and emotional recognition there. It's extremely problematic. It's uh, it's high risk now, but it could have been uh, better. Uh, another problem, because you asked two or three bullet points, uh, is uh, the definition of vulnerability. Maybe we can talk. It's uh, uh, there are lights and shadows. I like the fact that it has been expanded from the Commission proposal because the Commission was proposing to ban just uh, vulnerability based on age and disability. Now it's also social and economic conditions, Article Five B. Um, Still, there's something that could have been uh, uh, um, better included, but maybe in the positive parts, we can say that there is another article that expands this view. Fria, we already mentioned there are some limits for the fundamental right impact assessment, the participation and uh, um, the, the, the periodic uh, 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 timeline. Uh, maybe a last thing that was also criticized a lot by NGOs in the last uh, moment is Article 29 about ex post biometric surveillance. It was something that was uh, added in the very hot discussion about Article 5, so about biometric surveillance. The ex-ante biometric, the real-time biometric surveillance is now more or less limited with several caveats and uh, disclaimers, but the ex-post surveillance is, uh, is still possible, uh, so the ex-post analysis of biometric things. What we should cherish, what we should treasure is the data protection laws and data retention laws. So we should now really make sure that this Article 29 will not will be limited by data protection laws about retention, about you know uh, uh, the possibility of not processing data beyond purposes, etc. Yeah, it's interesting this point of view because if we think of biometric data and in facial recognition, it will be a type of biometrics. Then we have at least the GDPR protection, the additional data protection uh, principles and rules. Interesting. Thank you. And Risto? Yeah, I have a couple of uh, thoughts. Uh, so firstly, I think this is a very long and complex regulation, and and so we can expect it to be very hard to implement in act, uh, in practice. So I, I've heard some people make the point in discussions that uh, it is basically like a Christmas tree. Everybody wanted to add something, and you know it grew and grew, uh, and and they got their favorite thing on the on the tree uh, as a for some kind of you know description of of, of the complexity or as a as a proxy for that. Uh, the senior policy advisor at the European Parliament, Laura Coroli, uh, she recently compared GDPR and AI Act on LinkedIn. And according to her, the AI Act has 180 recitals. So recitals are these background text, uh, background information for the specific provisions uh, compared to GDPR's 173 recitals, so more recitals. Uh, it has um, 113 articles compared to 99 articles in GDPR. And it has 68 definitions compared to 26 definitions in uh, GDPR. And it has 13 annexes and no annexes in GDPR. So, and, and people complain about how difficult GDPR enforcement has been over the last couple of years. Uh, we can expect this to be very challenging for the AI Act as well. Uh, I have re received tons of comments already from some stakeholders saying, hey, like, it looks good, uh, this... Uh, this AI act on paper, but like, what does this and that thing actually in practice mean? Like, what should we actually need to do? And my response to them uh, usually is, well, we should wait for the European Commission to develop guidelines. Uh, there will be technical standards, codes, codes of practices. You know, different people will develop new services, but it is going to be challenging, right? Lots of uh, lots of work ahead. Uh, and and maybe the second thing I would mention uh, here uh, is. A general purpose AI governance actually in this 
in this document is is quite weak uh, compared to like some some versions some uh, some negotiation proposals that were on the table based on some of the leaks that Luca shared and other technology journalists. For example, uh, it, it completely lacks uh, third party testing and auditing uh, compared to like I, I saw some version where uh, it was in independent testing and red teaming was mentioned. But at the end of the day, uh, providers need to perform model evaluations, for example, general purpose AI with systemic risk, these kinds of model providers, they need to perform model evaluations just internally. Uh, why should we trust uh, what the outcomes of the, that model evaluation that are coming from the companies? Uh, that's, that's significantly weaker than, uh, than could have been uh, reasonable. And yeah, I'll, I'll stop here because we're running out of time soon. Thank you. So now let's be technology optimist or uh, law-wise law optimistic. Is there something to celebrate? So is there, what, what are the, the positive sides? So Jean-Claude, let's start with you. Uh, yeah, I am an optimistic person in general. As a lawyer, I, I try to take the best of what we have. I'm positive about AI Act. So uh, I must say, I, I'm reading in the chat, there are different views that uh, no regulation is better than uh, uh, typos or, or something like that. I think we should keep clear in mind that uh, uh, AI has huge externalities, very high risks that we cannot just regulate through data protection because data protection is the last part and, and, and it depends on, 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 on many scope uh, problems about scope. We cannot just regulate through the platform problem because AI is affecting also us offline. I was mentioning the border. There were discussion I see I saw in the chat about the border. Actually, it applies to border. So it's not excluded from the scope, the AI act, I mean. So what is good? First of all, red flags. We have something that is prohibited, very clear. So what is good, I think, is that the risk analysis is not just left to the autonomy of companies. There is a political decision on what is in the red zone, in the prohibited zone. This is the first time. This is something where the European Union is saying, we, as, as fundamental right concepts, we set some threshold that cannot be overcome. So this is a first very good thing. Uh, second is... The fact that it was moved from a product safety tool uh, to a fundamental right tool, and we mentioned many things about that. The attention to vulnerability, the attention to different levels of risk assessment. There is a risk assessment at the level of uh, deployers, uh, which is the FRIA, and the risk assessment at the level of producers, which is the risk assessment or Article 9. And then we have risk assessment for general purpose AI. Um, it might seem a, a mess, but actually it's, it's setting important principles then we can spend 10 years to implement, but at least we have these principles that courts and regulators can use. Um, and maybe the last thing is uh, that it's the first law that clarifies on some important concepts that were never in a law, like the concept of bias, the concept again of general purpose AI, the concept of, of, of systemic risk. Um, it's, it's broad principles. There are many vague concepts, but at least for the first time, the law is not uh, uh, um, based on old concepts that might have problems. If we think at the U.S. systems, even for data protection, they're still based on tort law mostly or some national national laws like California, etc. But can we really in the age of informational capitalism, base the protection uh, of our data just on tort law. It's the same with AI. Could we just base the protection uh, uh, of fundamental rights in the age of AI just on data protection or platform regulation? Maybe not. So, yeah. <laughs> so, Luca? Thank you. Um, well, you know, if you look at the status quo, I think indeed the AI Act is an improvement, uh, in, especially in terms of uh, setting out a framework on how to manage risk and basically to set the boundaries for, for this new technology and what is allowed and what should not be allowed. I think, uh, though, in terms of uh, legal clarity, which was uh, one of the main uh, reasons to present this proposal uh, from the start. I think uh, the legislator could have done a, a better job. Uh, the, the commission will have to do some heavy lifting in terms of uh, clarifying what the text means in practice with these guide and guidelines and, and secondary acts. Um, 
overall, I think the the EU has taken a leading role also in terms of uh, prohibited practices and what should be, you know, not allowed uh, to be used. Uh, and uh, I think what we saw with the Council of uh, Europe, where they proposed that signatories also issue a moratorium on stuff like social scoring. I think this is one of uh, the, the positive sides of the AI Act. Then, of course, uh, we will see uh, quite significant um, compliance costs for companies, especially those in the high-risk area. I think that one of the risks uh, we could see from the AI Act is that companies prefer not to go and you know, create uh, applications in the high risk area simply because it's more costly for them. Uh, mm -hmm. But those are actually the areas uh, that might bring the most benefits to society. So, you know, uh, as with everything, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, overall, it's better than what we had before and sets out an horizontal framework for using artificial intelligence that is nowhere to be found uh at this time in the world i think that the job is not done i mean as we saw with the gdpr it, it it's the sixth year since the entry into force we are only starting to see now case law and you know uh international cases uh being uh, being uh, brought forward so i think for the a and 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 let's keep in mind that the gdpr didn't, didn't start the process. Huh? We had a data protection law and a privacy law before in Europe. The AI Act is completely starting from scratch. So I think this will be a long process. Uh, we are talking about five to 10 years to see uh, the most concrete effects in terms of shaping this uh, emerging market. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I don't think that the job is completely done because they, this discussion has also shown that there are limits to the AI Act uh, in terms of what it can do for copyrighted material. Uh, there will probably be an initiative of the Commission in the next mandate on this. Uh, there are already talks to have uh, some other vertical initiatives on AI in the workplace. So I think this will be one of the, um, you know, th this will remain on top of the agenda, uh, both in terms of legislation, but also in terms of enforcement in the next years. Uh, Risto? Yeah, a few things uh, that are really good in the Act. One is, uh, for example, the innovation measures for SMEs and um, EU startups. Uh, so there's Previously, I think it was Article 55, but now after some kind of reordering and renumbering, I think it's Article 62 that talks about specific measures uh, of innovation. So, uh, it, for example, there will be priority access for SMEs and EU-based startups for regulatory sandboxes. So these are environments where uh, SMEs can, without you know, see serious repercussions necessarily, uh, they can before they deploy something to the market, they can experiment, get some feedback, some guidance from uh, from regulators from, uh, yeah, to, to know that they comply with the AI Act. Uh, also, they hopefully will receive some uh, reduced, like they will receive some guidance uh, from to comply with the AI Act generally, and, and the re uh, fees will be reduced for them. The compliance costs will actually be lower uh, thanks to these innovation measures uh, is the hope based on this article. Um, also, the Commission will regularly review uh, whether the yeah how how large these costs are uh, for the SMEs and startups uh, to make sure that uh, if if it can uh, they could be reduced uh, if they're too large. So I think that's overall really good. Also, I think somebody mentioned earlier the uh, the future proofness about this regulation. I think everybody, all the policymakers, actually quite carefully considered future-proofing the AI Act, uh, which is partly why it's quite general and, and vague, uh, because they didn't want to be too specific and be outdated uh, immediately. Uh, so there are some instruments that allow the, the law to be changed. Um, so delegated implementing acts, these kinds of uh, secondary legislation that the Commission can develop. For example, the Commission can change the definition of AI system. They can uh, change the criteria that exempt AI systems from high-risk rules. 
Uh, they can change uh, what is in the higher risk use cases category and what isn't there. Uh, they can change uh, threshold, thresholds for classifying general purpose AI with systemic risk. Um, uh, technical documentation, they can change some things there. Um, so yeah, a bunch of things that they can change, which is quite good uh, to, because AI can advance quite quickly and, and we need to um, make the, the update a lot to be in line with those changes. Maybe final thing, uh, which maybe not everybody paid attention to, but I thought it was really good. So the, the AI Act covers the whole value chain better now than the, than the original version did. So the original version kind of focused much more on the deployers of AI systems. But now there's kind of more focus on the, the range of stakeholders, like the, the model developers, for example, the initial ones, especially when it comes to general purpose AI. They have a focus as well. The value chain is quite complicated uh, when it comes to AI development. It's kind of like car manufacturing. There's so many different bits and pieces. Uh, everybody can reduce, everybody has in that value chain some type of strengths and advantages and they can reduce certain risks and not others. For example, the initial model developer has a much stronger position to uh, yeah, share information about the initial model, the training data perhaps uh, uh, help, help them the final deployers comply with the uh, AI Act, whereas the final deployers, they know the use case better. They are very heavily involved with the clients. They, they know if they want to fine tune the initial model with their training data, they can curate, make sure that the training data is representative and unbiased and, and whatnot. So I think that was a really good addition to, to care about the value chain, make sure that different stakeholders have some obligations in that. Thank you, Risto. And the AI Act is only the beginning. And in your view, what are the next step? And also, if you could maybe thinking about the audience, what do, what do you say to the audience? Something that people could do right now, especially those in privacy departments or compliance department. Do you have something like? Do you have any recommendations for for the audience? So please, uh, Risto. Uh, sure, I, I think every, everybody can contribute to trying to interpret uh, the law in some way. They can uh, try to develop some tools that would help with that. For example, we at the FLI have. Uh, developed the uh, EU AI Act compliance checker, which is like a very simple tool that people can just use. Companies, organizations can kind of go through a questionnaire and think about you know, which one applies to them and kind of finally have some indication of whether they would have any legal obligations under the AI Act. It's kind of a tool to help them kind of make sense. Uh, another tool we have developed is the AI Act Explorer, uh, which is basically like a you know search tool to check different articles, search for specific things. You're interested in fundamental rights impact assessment. Where exactly is that in the AI Act? Let me just like search it quickly and stuff like that. So I, I think these kind of tools, like everybody can contribute in, in some way. Uh, you can yeah, you can just always educate yourself about uh, about the AI Act more broadly. But I, I would give recommendations to kind of. Uh, all the experts and the policymakers who are involved in this uh, process as well. Yeah, continue working on the AI liability directive. It's very important to, to finalize, finish that, uh, make sure that we have uh, damages, harms, um, you know, covered and, and it's in line with the AI Act and uh, with AI generally. Uh, also, uh, make sure, yeah, make sure that the AI office is as competent as possible, has, like, everybody can speak to their machine learning friends, to their legal uh, expert friends, uh, Tell them, hey, there's AI office. They're hiring. Maybe you want to contribute to that process. It's like one of one of a kind institution, um, and policymakers hopefully will take it seriously and make sure that uh, the budget is serious for this institution. The UK AI Safety Institute has committed, uh, has been able to commit something like 100 million pounds. Uh, the EU is still quite vague about how much money they have for this, so uh, that's a very important thing, and. Maybe finally, I would recommend just kind of to focus on a larger narrative about innovation slightly differently, like reframe the narrative from like, let's, let's uh, increase innovation or that kind of stuff, which is like a very general thing that everybody talks about, oh, AI helps innovation. Let's talk about actual meaningful applications for to, to solve some of the biggest pressing issues. Let's talk about AI for reducing uh, climate change, make sure like AI contributes to, uh, you know, global poverty and things like that. Like we don't want any kind of AI innovation. 
maybe we don't want em emotion uh, rec recognition. Maybe we want some other tools, some other uh, products that actually meaningfully help us innovate uh, in the direction that benefits everybody. So uh, yeah, we frame the narrative a, a bit on innovation. Thank you, Risto. Jean Claudio. Yeah, so uh, um, um, let's say recommendations, as you said, uh, maybe for the first for the regulator is to really uh, now implement Article 5. Let's understand what's prohibited in practice. And I, I know they're already working on that. DG Connect is working hard on that. It will be a, a, the very first important thing because it will be the basis of all the other uh, uh, legislation. What's, what, what's really Article 5, 1A, B, C, et cetera? Uh, for companies, uh, the, the, the most important thing, in my view, is to, uh, first of all, uh, taking uh, seriously the other uh, pieces of legislation, making sure that they're, as you said, we already mentioned things that are already there, and if they were taken more seriously, the AI Act would be easier. Privacy by design, uh, impact assessment in different forms we have in the DSA, in the, the GDPR, etc. If uh, we take these things seriously now, it will be easier to, to, to adapt the AI Act. And for most companies, uh, indeed, the FRIA is the challenge because they, as, as users, it's mostly their, their challenge. So trying to understand how to do impact assessment, building on existing models and connecting the models. Most of the people that will need to do this, Fria, have already a data protection impact assessment that is maybe based on poor uh, reductionist questionnaires based mostly on cybersecurity. We should go to the next step. We should wonder what is impact on fundamental rights. And this will, be, this will make things easier for the Fria. Thank you, Luca. Thanks. Um, I'll second what was said before on the AA office and, you know, ensure that it's sufficiently staffed and resourced. I mean, if you look at stuff like Article 5 or Annex 3 on the high risk categories, it's clear that these are are uh, written in the sand. I mean, they, they can become out of date very quickly. Uh, so the commission should keep the polls on where the industry is going and engage with stakeholders, uh, experts, not just as a tick the box exercise, but actually uh, having meaningful uh, exchanges with experts. Uh, for the private sector, of course, now everyone is trying to figure out uh, if uh, they fall in the high risk category or not. I cannot tell you that, of course. Um, what I can tell you is that there will be plenty of B2B uh, services coming your way and uh, AI, safety uh, organizations and so on. So you'll be fully covered. I think there will be a temptation to underestimate risk uh, that should be resisted, especially from startups that need the money now and can risk a fine for later. I think this will be uh you know probably punished uh by investors so that th there should be a responsible behavior in this sense uh but i mean as i as i said before the text is still not fully clear uh and legal departments will have to scratch their heads over it um let me just conclude by saying that the ai liability directive I don't find it particularly relevant, actually. A liability for artificial intelligence is already covered by the product liability directive that has a strict liability regime, much stricter than the AI liability directive, which at this point we don't even know if it will happen since the parliament uh, is doing an alternative impact assessment. So, you know, this is uh, still to be seen, but actually, if it's not on your radar, product liability directive is much more relevant. It will cover uh, all type of products, including software, including AI, um, and probably foundation models too. So, you know, the impact uh, that we will see coming from private enforcement, I think will also be very relevant. And I'll close with that. Thank you, Luca. So we are, our time is over. So where can people find you? You can say anything, your newsletter, your blog, your, your social networks. So Luca, where can people find you? You can follow my work on LinkedIn and X. 
Okay, listo. Uh, same, LinkedIn and X uh, slash Twitter. And uh, John Claudio? Yeah, same, LinkedIn and X. And maybe just to say follow also the ELO website, our research department. We have a summer school on this topic and other initiatives. So maybe just to say. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in the next live sessions. Bye-bye, everyone.